Good evening, everyone. My name is Kate Mayer, a member of St. Francis Cabrini Catholic Church, and I'll be your host and moderator for tonight's session. On behalf of our parish and its Tegeter Talk working group, welcome to all of you. We're happy that you joined us to hear from Bishop Ann Svenningsen and Archbishop Bernard Hebda on the topic of welcoming refugees and immigrants. Let us begin in prayer. In the name of our ever-living, ever-loving, and ever-unfolding God, you led our dear patron saint, Francis Xavier Cabrini, around the world serving immigrants. By her example, teach us concern for the stranger. By her prayers, help us to see Christ in all who have been, are, and ever will be immigrants. All creation are immigrants journeying on this earth in your grace. By your guidance and Mother Cabrini's inspiration, may we love boldly and work tirelessly to correct injustice. May civic leaders recognize the dignity of all people and the sanctity of the family. May our nation, our worship spaces, and our hearts be places of welcome. Continue to send forth our former pastor, Mike Tegeter's spirit within these talks to continue to guide us with his love for justice and action for preferential options for the poor. We ask this through the intercession of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, patroness of immigrants. Amen. Amen. Father Mike Tegeter, former pastor of St. Francis Cabrini Catholic Church, is the inspiration for the Tegeter Talk series. Father Mike was known for both the warmth of his pastoral care and his passionate resolve for social justice. He stood up for what he believed was right, even if it meant challenging those in power. Shortly before he passed away in 2016, Father Mike expressed to a Cabrini colleague, if I have any legacy at Cabrini, I hope it is that I try to encourage adult conversation about vital things. And so the Tegeter Talks series was initiated and now hosts acclaimed speakers to address vital topics of faith and social justice, and most importantly, to encourage conversation. Tonight will be no different as we explore the topic of welcoming the stranger. Such conversations are the legacy of Father Mike Tegeter. His spirit is alive as he continues to inspire a church and society to come together in conversation for the pursuit of justice. The majority of our time together tonight will primarily be a conversation between Bishop Svenningsen and Archbishop Hebda, but you will also have the opportunity to participate in a brief small group discussion. And further instructions will be given later in the session about that. And finally, we'll reconvene in this large group for some closing remarks and a final prayer. During the presentations by the bishops, as you heard earlier, you're welcome to use the chat feature to ask your own questions. Our team will monitor those questions that come in throughout the evening, and our bishops will answer several of them during that closing portion of the night. Now, let us welcome our guests, both of whom were signatories to a 2019 joint message by Catholic and ELCA bishops in Minnesota in support of refugee resettlement in our state. In addition to being the first woman to serve as bishop in any of the six Minnesota synods of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Bishop Ann Svenningsen, her Minneapolis Synod, and the ELCA have become staunch advocates for migrants and refugees. In 2016, the ELCA committed to a strategy to accompany, min excuse me, accompany migrant minors with protection, advocacy, representation, and opportunities at its churchwide assembly. Three years later, the ELCA took the historic step of declaring itself to be a sanctuary church body at its 2019 churchwide assembly. Bishop Svenningsen's Minneapolis Area Synod 
then immediately followed up with the adoption of a powerful statement declaring itself to be a sanctuary synod of the ELCA and fully defining what it means to be a sanctuary church. Welcome Bishop, Bishop Spenningson. Since coming to us from Newark in 2015, Archbishop Bernard Hebda has also been a vocal advocate for migrants and refugees. In February 2019, Archbishop Hebda appeared at a state capital news conference to speak out forcefully on behalf of driver's licenses for all. At that news conference, he declared that the passage of that legislation, which he declared to be long overdue, was a moral imperative. After just a few weeks, excuse me, just a few weeks ago on August 14th, Archbishop Hebda joined a press conference of civic and church leaders in Bloomington and spoke in support and interfaith unity with Imam Mohammed Mukhtar, who had been assaulted while on his way to the Dar al Farouk Islamic Center. Welcome, Archbishop Hebda. Thank you. One last reminder, you can submit questions for the bishops via the chat uh, at any time during the presentation. Bishops, if you're ready, I'll introduce the audience to our first discussion topic. As we begin tonight's conversation, may we reflect on this verse from Matthew chapter 25. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. We live in a country and world in which we see increasing rejection of migrants and refugees. In Pope Francis's 2019 message on migrants and refugees, he says, the signs of meanness we see around us heighten our fear of the other, the unknown, the marginalized, the foreigner. As we listen to tonight's conversation, I challenge us as individuals to look inwardly and identify the obstacles, fears, and perhaps prejudices that keep us from welcoming the other and to identify what we can personally do in our attitude, words, and actions to integrate migrants and refugees into our society. Our faith is our guide. Bishop Hebda, I'll start with you. I'll ask you this. What do scripture and our faith traditions teach us about how we should respond to migrants and refugees? Yes. Thank you, that's a, a great question. And uh, certainly the, the passage that you cited um, from Matthew 25 is one of the most frequently cited passages from scripture that speaks to us explicitly of that need to uh, welcome the stranger. But when we, we look through sacred scripture and this, the stories that are there, we see so many instances where the experience of the migrant is highlighted. And so whether we look at the, in the Old Testament, when we consider uh, the Israelites as they went into Egypt and the experience that they had there, uh, they were encouraged to have that real respect uh, for the stranger, always reminding or being reminded as we hear in Leviticus that they were once aliens in the land of Egypt. And I, I think that's one of the experiences in scripture that's so helpful for us is when we recognize that that we are all aliens in, in some way, and uh, that we look deep into our own experiences uh, to recognize that, and it becomes easier then uh, to empathize with others. We certainly see that also in the experience uh, that the Holy Family had, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, as, as they're forced to flee because of Herod's rage. And so from the very beginning in the New Testament, we have the story of a, of a refugee family, and and really then Jesus's experience is always uh, formed from that, his human experience is formed from that as well. And so it's not surprising that when we, when we hear the Lord speak about how it is that when we are respond to the stranger, that we're responding to him, it's very believable. And we certainly see that in the early church as well. So when um, the Apostle Paul is able to to tell people that in, in the, the, the church of Jesus, 
that there is neither Jew nor Greek, that we're all one in Christ Jesus, uh, that we all have an equal dignity and responsibility. So the, the scriptural basis for our church teaching about migrants and refugees and welcoming them, avoiding that meanness that you spoke about, Kate, is pretty clear. In our Catholic tradition, we would say that the, the roots of an articulated teaching on immigration and refugees is, is always been there, but we, we hear it first articulated um, about 130 years ago in the encyclical letter Rerum Novarum. It's the first time where uh, the church is looking in general at the economic situation, the uh, social situation, realizes the importance of speaking about refugees. So uh, Pope Leo XIII in that, at that encyclical 1891 is able to begin to really deepen, to go further articulate uh, a specific teaching about why it is that we believe that refugees have, have rights and, and have, they have to be respected. Certainly then after the Second World War, uh, Pope Pius XII also, as he's looking at the refugee crisis that was affecting those who were fleeing from Europe, uh, took that a step further and, and also issued another encyclical letter, Exul Familia, or we often say in English, the emigre family, that gets even more specific about that. But the, the, the teaching has, has been clear since then as well. Certainly Pope Francis is, is, uh, is able to really offer us a very powerful witness of not only the consistency of the teaching, but also it being a priority. Many of us, when he was first elected, were looking to see what's the first thing that the Pope is going to do. And you might remember that his first trip was to the Isle of Lampedusa, which had been uh, this little island in the middle of the Mediterranean where uh, so many uh, refugees had uh, found their way after they'd been arrested. Also an area where people had lost their lives in, in, in the sea. And so it was a very powerful image and he offered mass that day on uh, the uh, wood that was from the wreckage of one of those ships and invited the refugees who were, who were uh, there on that island uh, to be part of that celebration. So he certainly uh, really brought that to a higher level. But we have three basic principles in our Catholic tradition that uh, I think from our Catholic social tradition that are important. I won't uh, go too far into this. But first of all is that People have the right to migrate to sustain their lives and the lives of their families. That's pretty fundamental for us. And we find that in Rerum Novarum, we find that in Exul Familia, uh, but that, that has to be something that, that we're willing to respect. At the same time, you know, the church always is a, uh, uh, we're reminded it's both and, right? So then the second principle though, is that a country has the right to regulate its borders and to control immigration. So that's also a, a, a very important part of Catholic social teaching. But then the third principle that's really applicable to that is that when a country regulates its borders, it has to be able to do that with justice and mercy. And so when, when we are faced with concrete situations, we recognize that in, in our world today that there are so many people who have had to leave their homelands, who have had to uh, leave those places that are so important to them uh, because they have no other choice, whether it be the violence, whether it be the poverty, whether it be the lack of, of basic human necessities uh, that they've had to, to leave. And so uh, we as, as Catholics have to be, uh, and I think it was really broader than that, really our, our Christian tradition tells us that we have to be very concrete in the way that we welcome the stranger and being open to uh, um, really meeting their needs as if they were, were Christ. And so that's, that's the challenge that's before us uh, this evening, for sure. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Bishop Ann, I'll turn to you with that same question. What do scripture and our faith traditions teach us about how we should respond to migrants and refugees? And John, I think we need to unmute Bishop Ann. Okay, um, that now I'm, you can hear me, right? Wonderful. 
So first, I want to thank you, Kate, for moderating this conversation. Um, and I want to thank the Congregation of St. Francis Cabrini for hosting this important event and, and timely event. And, and thank God for the powerful witness of Father Tegeder. I wish I had known him, but his witness continues to bless us, I believe. I'm delighted to be here with uh, Archbishop Hebda. Together, we have walked in the clergy march after the death of George Floyd. We've traveled to Rome with the Together in Hope Ecumenical Choir. And we have met annually with all the Minnesota bishops from the Catholic ELCA and the Catholic Church, a retreat that's been held annually for over 35 years, which is quite uh, something. And I treasure our partnership, Archbishop uh, Hebda, and I'm grateful to be here with you tonight. Yes, I will agree the scriptural call to welcome the stranger is abundantly clear. And I picked the very same texts that have been said, love the stranger as yourself, for you were strangers in Egypt from Leviticus, and then Jesus' word, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. We're not always uh, living up to this calling, uh, both in biblical times, we didn't quite live up to it, nor in church history, but the calling in God's word is clear. And in thinking about Luther and teaching on immigration, I can almost hear Martin Luther use the ancient question and answer method of catechism. What does it mean? What does it mean to welcome the stranger? When he asks what the commandment you shall not kill means, Luther writes, we are to fear and love God so that we do not harm or endanger our neighbor in any way, but help and support them in all of life's needs. A lot more than just don't kill. So welcome the stranger. What does that mean for us? The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America would answer the question also with some real specifics. I think of five of them to name. Regard each person with dignity, for each person is a beloved creature of God. Make sure your country does its fair share in our global responsibility to welcome immigrants and refugees. As you welcome others, do not discriminate on the basis of race or religion. Pay special attention to children and the reunification of families. And as you enforce your policies, as Bishop Hebda spoke about in the second of his three items, do so regarding each person with dignity and as a beloved creature of God. Lots of specifics. Um, but sadly, of course, we know our country hasn't lived up to these values. At our founding, indigenous peoples and African Americans were denied citizenship. Racism prompted the Chinese Exclusion Acts and the Mexican Repat Repatriation Act. We've discriminated against Jews and Muslims, Catholics, have also known the experience of inhospitality in our borders, often at the hands of Protestants, my forebears, when they arrived in this country. Especially tragic today in 2020 was our country's capping the number of refugees at 18,000, the lowest it's been in the last 37 years. Prior, between 1980 and, and 2017, we averaged accepting 95,000 refugees into our country. 18,000 is not probably what one consider our proper and fair share of welcoming and serving the global common good. So one of our callings, I think, as people of faith is to advocate for expanding that number, to doing what is good for the global community, the global welfare. And we can't do that advocacy work by ourselves. We need each other. 
It was really remarkable that we as Catholic and ELCA bishops in Minnesota signed every one of us this editorial. You have no idea how many versions it took for us to get to a place where we all agreed, but we did. And it was a way that we showed our unity in Christ as well as our passion for this issue. On a national scale, we are blessed with uh, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services and Catholic Charities, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, who work in partnership on these issues. I think it's interesting too, and I just want to say that the social teachings of the Catholic and Lutheran traditions align on so many issues, immigration just one of them, and one of the hidden gems of the ELCA is this library of social teachings developed through our own process of communal discernment. They're easy to find. You can just Google ELCA racism statement or sexism statement or immigration or criminal justice or care for creation. The library is tiny compared to the vast library of Catholic social teaching, but it builds on such work for our current day and I think it's wonderful to see how we agree, Catholics and the ELCA, on so very much. Thank you, Bishop Ann. And thank you both. I think that gives us some very specific things that we can look to do in our own lives uh, to advocate for immigrants and refugees. Uh, let's move on to kind of our second section, our second question of the evening. Uh, another reminder, audience, that chat screen is still available if you have any follow-up questions from the first section. As I mentioned in the introduction, in December 2019, and Bishop Ann just spoke of it as well, every Lutheran and Catholic bishop in Minnesota endorsed a message calling for refugees to be permitted to settle in our state. It seems very hopeful that our two churches were able to work together and support each other in addressing this issue with a joint response. Bishop Ann, will head right back to you for this question. How can our churches, through clergy and lay members, best address fear and hostility directed toward migrants and refugees in our own congregations and communities? Yes, thank you. I'm, I think always um, when we are talking about fear of the Apostle John's words in 1 John, perfect love casts out fear. And I think those words ring as true today as ever. The church is called to be a vessel of God's love, to teach neighbor love, to live neighbor love. And that all begins with relationships, relationships with others. Just a few weeks ago, I was blessed to sit with two immigrants who have, who have no documents, and I felt as I was sitting with them that I was on sacred ground. There we were, masks on, six feet apart, sitting in the backyard of a congregation. I heard their story, the daily, hourly, ever-present fear of being deported, sent home maybe after being stopped for a broken headlight or because they sought medical care or because someone came to their job site. The fear was overwhelming. Kind of as they talked, it felt to me like you were, they were being stalked almost, that kind of fear. And most of all, they talked about how they feared they might put their loved ones in jeopardy so they sought sanctuary to protect those they loved. Where can we build? Where can you and I build such relationships with others that are open our hearts and our eyes to the perfect love of God, love for the stranger, the refugee, the asylum seeker? Like the Catholic Church in Minnesota, our 
Synod congregations worship in many languages. We are deeply blessed by the Swahili congregation, the Hmong congregation, the Oromo congregation, by three Spanish-speaking congregations, St. Paul's, Tapestry, Cristo, Obrero, and our personal relationships as well as our congregational partnerships deepen day by day of our understanding of the experience of migrants and refugees. In addition, we have wonderful social service ministries that provide opportunities. Maybe we could help out in an ELCA, e, e, ELCA I'm just going to say ELCA all the time, an ESL classroom, or we could become a circle of welcome congregation through LSS, a sanctuary or sanctuary supporting congregation through Isaiah. You mentioned that we voted la last year to become a sanctuary denomination. We're still trying to figure out what that means exactly, but for sure it means walking alongside immigrants and refugees and seeing that commitment to be in relationship is a matter of our faith in Jesus Christ. So there are lots of ways we can build relationships. And I think that as we seek to do that and be intentional about that, that fear is addressed in the love and the friendships that we create. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Hebdo will ask you the same. How can our churches through clergy and lay members best address fear and hostility directed toward migrants and refugees in our own congregations and communities? Yes. So I, I certainly think it's an important topic for preaching and, um, and, and teaching as well. But I, I think those opportunities uh, to preach where we have the, the largest audience is something that's really crucial. And, and certainly to uh, talk about our social teaching on immigration as being at the heart of who we are as a church. So it's not an add-on or optional, it's, it's at the heart of who we are and what we do. Every year in Minnesota, we've always been celebrating a, a day where we ask all of our priests to preach on, uh, Catholic priests to preach on immigration deacons too. Uh, we were doing that always at, on the Feast of the Epiphany. And um, which, which worked out well. We did a whole week of teachings as well in our schools. Uh, but last year we, we opted to uh, change that date and to conform with the International Day for uh, Migrants and Refugees. This year it'll be September 27th. It's a, uh, we, we always, we schedule a, a mass that celebrates our diversity on that day. And we ask all of our priests to preach on the importance of welcoming the stranger. So we're hoping that that's going to happen. This year it's a little bit uh, more challenging with COVID. We were planning a, a large liturgy at the cathedral at that evening. Not sure what we're going to be able to do. Last year we brought together uh, many of our refugee communities to, to sing or to pray at that, uh, on that occasion. That won't be so clear this year, but um, certainly to be able to, to preach with conviction about uh, about what we see the scripture saying and what our church tradition um, uh, has made clear. Also, I, I think the importance of uh, our, our pastors have a unique opportunity uh, to dissipate that fear uh, by bringing together people of diverse backgrounds. And so we've had an experience this year where we've asked a number of um, young adults who uh, have benefited from DACA in the past, dreamers, uh, to come and to, and to accompany one of the bishops at a parish and, and just to, in, to tell their story, even at Mass. And uh, we haven't come to St. Francis Cabrini because you're, you're already among those who are, who are strongly in support of our immigrant brothers and sisters. But it's, it's beautiful when our people get to hear those stories, those eyewitness stories from young people who are able to speak of their, their own experience. And, and they, they look like the rest of us, they speak like the rest of us, and uh, it's been really, really helpful uh, to be able to share those, uh, those stories. And so I think those kinds of things, a, a pastor can certainly um, 
uh, implement in, 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 in the parish to have those opportunities to bring people in to share their experiences. But um, it's most powerful when it's people who are already there in the pew who are able to, to speak about this or even to recall those, those moments when, when our own families were, uh, were immigrants. But there's a real openness to that. We're blessed in Minnesota as well, for the most part. My, my first experience with refugees was when I was a, a seminarian in Rome and uh, St. John Paul had asked all of the seminaries, it was the time of the great famine in Ethiopia in the early 80s. And uh, St. John Paul had asked all of the seminaries to take in refugees from Ethiopia um, who had come to Italy in great number, overwhelming really their social service system. And um, we would take a good number of them at the North American College. And my recollection is that for those who were uh, more, more of them went to Canada and Australia than to the United States. But those who were coming to the United States were coming to Minnesota. So even though I had never been here, we would be telling these, these men about what Minnesota was like. We would be giving them our winter coats to take with them <laughs> as they went for the first time. But at that point, I was thinking how wonderful it was that there was that tradition in Minnesota of being open in that way. It's, it's part of the, the, the fabric of of, of this society that we need to continue to remind people of and to develop as well. But I think just sharing stories is a way in which uh, we're able to, to do that. Uh, Kate, I was so impressed with your prayer opening prayer today, you know, speaking about St. Francis Cabrini and uh, really just the way in which she's certainly even just teaching about her and, and, and uh, her own apostolate among immigrants is something that's very powerful. And when I, I first lived in New York City, we always invoked St. Francis Cabrini when we needed a parking space, which wasn't the yeah. best. Right? St. Francis Cabrini, don't be a meanie, find me a parking space. That was what New Yorkers say. But when I was in, in Newark, which was one of the places where she had worked with uh, uh, immigrant Italians in particular, you realize this was a strong woman who had such strong convictions and that pushes the church in that way and so really for us to be advocates and really to encourage our people to, to advocate, uh, advocate for uh, immigrants and refugees is really important. Bishop Ann spoke about the, the numbers of refugees that are permitted into our country. And I, I noticed that today there's a, a great website that's linked to the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops called Justice for Immigrants. And today they released a statement signed by many, many faith organizations calling for 95,000, so a, a, an increase for sure. But it's a wonderful way in which we're able to uh, really partner with uh, those from other churches, those from other faith traditions. But that work of advocacy is, is, is crucially important. Our own Minnesota Catholic Conference has been uh, doing some of that work here as well. You mentioned the driver's license issue as we try to get people to write to their uh, their representatives and their state senators on those important issues. So for us to take seriously um, those opportunities uh, to, to make a difference. Thank you, Bishop Haddam. Moving into our third and final um, main question for the bishops. Returning to Pope Francis's 2019 message on migrants and refugees, he emphasizes that it's not just about migrants, it's about our humanity. 2020 has brought us COVID-19, community uprising, economic struggle, and general uncertainty. And through it all, we have seen a tremendous outpouring of generosity and compassion by people from all over the Twin Cities to help clean up and provide basic needs to those impacted. We really have displayed our humanity. And I think back to the previous question, really developed those relationships with our own community members. Uh, Bishop Hebdell, return to you to start us off on this question. What are some concrete suggestions for us in the audience on how we can create a welcoming society? And I think we have heard many already today, but in particular, um, as we are in the midst of this unprecedented global pandemic and the economic downturn. What might you add to the list of concrete suggestions? Yes, so we've been really um, 
blessed here with an outpouring of support from the faith community. And I can speak about uh, that coming from the Catholic tradition uh, in, in these circumstances. And so uh, even when we have um, conference calls, we've been doing that every Tuesday with faith leaders and the Department of uh, Public Health. Um, they've been signaling, for example, the, the great work that's being done at, at Incarnation in Minneapolis in terms of testing uh, for COVID. And that so many of the immigrant uh, families have found an opportunity uh, to uh, get COVID tests uh, there. And at the same time, they're providing a, a, an amazing number of, of, of meals uh, for families to take home. And, and that's really, it's uh, through the, the work certainly of the St. Vincent de Paul Society and uh, their ability to mobilize resources. But uh, really, uh, as our parishes have had uh, greater knowledge and the people in our parishes have greater knowledge of the needs, uh, then people have been able to respond as well. So we, after uh, the destruction that we saw on Lake Street and University, uh, and, and the, certainly when we heard about how families were disrupted, their, uh, their kids were frightened in those circumstances, uh, uh, we set up uh, through the Catholic Community Foundation an emergency fund that has really been of assistance. Uh, immediately, it was helping families perhaps to find another place to live if their place was, uh, was uh, destroyed or, or damaged. Uh, or even just a place to get away in the, when their kids were frightened. So, uh, and then certainly we've, we've seen at so many of our uh, parishes and schools, the need for uh, basic uh, uh, foods, food items, uh, but also personal items. And so we had a great video at the Ministries Day last week uh, that uh, highlighted, for example, uh, the way in which people have come together at Holy Rosary in Minneapolis, uh, when you see that their, their, their parking lot just filled with, with groceries and, and uh, uh, you know, all, all, all kinds of items that are, would be important for a family, diapers and pampers and all of those kinds of things, uh, you realize that there are those concrete ways in which we're able to, to assist people that really comes out, out, out of our faith tradition. So those uh, looking for those opportunities uh, within our community and more broadly uh, to have that kind of an impact. And I, I think those opportunities are, are there. But I think particularly about St. Vincent de Paul, I think about that emergency fund at the Catholic Community Foundation. And I think about the work that's being done in our, our parishes. I mentioned Incarnation and Holy Rosary, but we see that at Risen Christ School as well. And uh, we, we the beautiful outreach at uh, St. Albert the Great. So many of our parishes that are serving uh, immigrant families uh, are, are able to recognize those needs. Uh, I was speaking earlier today with Bishop Ann and I, I talked to her about the mass we had yesterday at Holy Rosary. And, you know, most of the families there are immigrants from Latin America and they came together. Everybody's concerned certainly about COVID because the incidents are so high, but to find ways in which they're still able to come together. And so we had an out, outdoor mass in the park across from the street and really was a, was a, was a wonderful opportunity uh, to celebrate uh, the presence of the Dominicans who had been there for 142 years, but also to give the members of the parish that opportunity to come together in a safe way. Thank you, Bishop. Yeah, it's a heartwarming list when we hear of all the good, good work that's going on. Uh, Bishop Ann, I'll give you a chance to add to that list of concrete suggestions, um, particularly given the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as our economic downturn that's happening. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, yeah, really sort of um, focused on the part of the question about the COVID pandemic. And um, it's interesting to me because I really believe a global pandemic should cause an either, even greater outpouring of love for the refugee not, and not really turn us inward. Um, I remember conversations so distinctly. Uh, refugees currently uh, have a higher number represented in essential work. Uh, than the general population. And a few years ago, I met with a couple construction workers who were undocumented. And 
they had both suffered um, injury on the job, um, but neither could go to the clinic because it felt like a choice between going to the clinic or being deported. And that sticks with me as I think about people being afraid to get tested and how can we um, help, you know, to make that uh, possibility for, you know, for everyone. Um, it's also the case that one of my favorite organizations that works on, on refugee issues is the International Rescue Committee, res rescue.org. And it really makes a strong case that the U.S. has to play a leading role in building a coherent global response to the coronavirus. If you think about refugee camps around the world and what this terrifying virus could mean in those camps, um, what, what role could we play to be a source of, um, you know, humanitarian aid and work to prevent um, this, uh, you know, pandemic and its um, effects. Back when our country was still welcoming 95,000 refugees a year, my family was privileged to welcome Eritrean refugees into our home when I was a pastor in Edina. The refugees had fled, um, took, taking weeks, uh, only traveling at night to make it to a refugee camp. And they came to this country in search of welcome. Well, I was a young pastor then, and my husband and I had three little kids. We were blessed with a big parsonage there in Edina, right next to the church. And we were ready to welcome this family in our home. We knew there were two cousins, and we knew that one of the cousins was married, and we knew that she was going to have a baby. In fact, she was eight months pregnant when she arrived at our house. <laughs> and we kind of looked at ourselves, my husband and I said, is there any way we're ready for all of this? But of course, our three little kids said, hey, this is like Christmas. We're going to have a baby born right here in our house. And everything worked just wonderfully. Although, you know, you think about how welcome you know, occurs. It wasn't all just smooth. Um, our first dinner to together, I'll never forget, we were surprised when our guests, we all sat down and our guests used their hands to get, to get the food from the main dish in the center of the table. And of course, we'd heard, you know, about TB and malaria and other concerns. And we thought, well, should we be nervous? And I just want to say there can be discomfort, right, with the unfamiliar. But I think we are learning, especially as white people, myself, that discomfort is often where we are called to be. The call of Jesus is, I think, to lean into that discomfort, to name and to fight against that white fragility and to learn how to love. And um, so I, I don't always tell about the discomfort part of that experience with refugees, but today I said, no, I gotta, I gotta talk about that because I think sometimes we're so afraid of discomfort, we avoid what we really are called to do in loving the neighbor. Oh yes, during this COVID pandemic, we may not have as many opportunities. We don't have as many opportunities to sit and be with others as we so want to do. But there's, there are books that are powerful. There are movies that are powerful. Maybe we should have a Catholic Lutheran book club that studies some of these powerful stories of people escaping from horrors and finding their way to new life in a new land. Um, I just, a couple final things that I think are, I want to say that I think are important. One is there's a program called Guardian Angels that the ELCA is working on, which um, is a, another way to get involved. And it really, it, it kind of, uh, provides legal sort of presence. It's sort of, they talk about it, if you volunteer to do this, you are the presence of the church in the courtroom for people going through um, those kinds of um, experiences in the process of uh, seeking asylum status. But I also wanna um, 
just talk a little bit about, again, working for justice and advocating. Um, and we, in our um, synod, have decided that community organizing, face-based community organizing, is one of the best ways that we can make a difference in the public square. So if it's like one license, you know, that we're both Catholics and Lutherans committed to, what might happen if we together um, began that kind of faith practice, I think, of organizing for change in the public square. Um, it goes back to one of my favorite Lutherans who said, uh, uh, when, when Jewish people in Germany uh, were not, <laughs> were called second-class citizens and worse. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one to say, we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, are not simply to bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are called at times to drive a spoke in the wheel itself. So how do we join hands in the seeking the kind of justice that we believe God calls for all people to experience. So that's, and now we get to ask, ask other, hear other questions and seek to answer them. So I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both, Bishop Tunningson and Archbishop Hebdon. Uh, very thoughtful conversation. I think it gave us a lot to reflect on and um, as we exercise our own humanity and welcoming the stranger and developing those relationships. Uh, after we give our audience a chance to discuss what they've heard, we will bring everyone back together and ask a few more questions of the bishops that have been submitted via the chat function. But now is the time we're going to move the audience into a small group discussion time frame or time period, and our technical host, John, will now explain to how, us how that's going to work. John? Often uh, the bishops are indeed writing to the, the administration or writing to uh, the you know senators or Congress people uh, on on these issues. I, I mentioned a little bit earlier today about the uh, request from faith leaders uh, for the to up the cap for refugees to ninety five thousand. That's that would be on that site. Uh, a few weeks ago, it was asking for more funding. Uh, COVID-19 funding specifically uh, for migrants and refugees. Also this summer was a letter asking for ex expansion of uh, DACA, uh, those kinds of things. So seeing how much is done, I think it would be a little bit uh, surprising. But we also have those opportunities as with the letter that the Catholic bishops and the Lutheran bishops penned uh, to be able to address you know, issues like that as well. We certainly were, were trying to raise the issue in the, uh, to the attention not only of our own uh, followers, those who belong to our churches, uh, but also to the public. And so when, as we were addressing different audiences in that letter, we were trying, besides those who are faithful in our pews, uh, also to uh, be most specifically addressing uh, Governor Waltz and our, those who were involved in those county by county determinations. So I think there's already some uh, structures that are there and most of us have opportunities for um, in, engaging lay faithful to support in terms of uh, letter writing or emailing um, those who represent us to make sure that those issues uh, get a fair hearing. But both the USCCB site and the Minnesota Catholic Conference site from the Catholic perspective would provide those kinds of opportunities for a, a network networking to uh, uh, really voice our opinions on these issues. Bishop Ann, do you have something to add? To yeah, it's just a kind of, uh, I'm just sitting here thinking that, you know, we have a very similar uh, opportunities through Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services and the ELCA Advocacy Office that, um, wouldn't it wouldn't it be something if if there could be some alignment that when something comes out from the conference Catholic Conference of Bishops 
that that Lutherans also were sort of writing the letters on the same thing at the same time, just to multiply the, because I think the call uh, for, you know, different kinds of advocacy, there's a lot of similarities there in terms of increasing DACA or um, increasing the number to 95,000. I also just think that advocacy right now in, you know, on the eve of September 1st, the fall, uh, election coming up that advocacy has to do with how we vote and again I talked about the rescue.org um, website they have three really significant questions that they would encourage us to ask each person that we vote for in terms of their position on the number of, of folks we um, uh, allow to come into the country in terms of um, the support that we will be providing in terms of COVID and how that will be affecting especially refugee camps and our role um, in that. So, so voting, I think, is a really key place where we are advocates for the justice that we think is um, God is calling us to. to. Oh, and the one license thing, that's still a, a, an issue we need to work on. And since we're both Catholic and Lutheran in this state um, committed to that, maybe we can find some new ways this spring with our legislature to, to talk about that. Great. Thank you both. Um, there is also several questions related to topic. Um, when we're talking about migrants and refugees, it can be a divisive issue particularly talking with those that may not agree how to advocate or how to act um, in our congregations and communities. So how do we find that common ground with one another, particularly with those that may have a different viewpoint as we do? Yeah, I think one of the important things to remember is that the call to love our neighbor applies across the board. It applies to our love for the refugee and um, the person is trying to escape, you know, war and um, uh, difficult situations in, in their home countries, but it also applies to uh, loving those who disagree with us and not, um, I mean, I think one of the struggles that we have in our country right now is our unwillingness, our inability to sit and have those difficult conversations, those uncomfortable conversations. And um, as people of faith, as people who follow Jesus, I hope, I hope that kind of love, um, not that we have to agree with everyone we talk with, but the call to love and to to try to stay in relationship with others i think is is an important thing and if we can model that in some ways maybe we'll see some changes in our you know public conversation that just seems to be more polarized than ever I think that's so insightful, Bishop. You know, when uh, the Catholic bishops and Lutheran bishops wrote that uh, the letter before Christmas, you know, that was one of the things that they talked about uh, specifically was that we don't demonize those who who don't share our views. You know, so I think that uh, and they had a great line. We had a great line. We need to build bridges of dialogue instead of walls of resentment. Huh? And I think if we're able to enter into those dialogues, we have a a chance also of hearing what are those points of fear um, or misinformation that um, might be motivating those who are very much opposed to welcoming the stranger as maybe the, the two of us or uh, the bishops would, uh, would think along those lines, right? So if we're able to understand a little bit better what it is that motivates right. uh, their opposition, then that gives us a, a chance to uh, begin to address those things. So I, I think that we, we, there are those opportunities, but they're not always easy to uh, pursue. So. Yeah, I think the Minnesota Council of Churches uh, has a program called Respectful Conversations, and, um, and it's designed to be used in a congregation where there's disagreement about an issue. But 
there might be just tools that each of us could learn individually about how to, um, you know, have those kinds of conversations when when we disagree and um, and and work hard at being um, present and not um, you know hooked in to that kind of win lose mentality. Yes, I think I'm amazed. You know, we we. We have these times now where everybody's doing genealogical research, right? They've they've all sent away their DNA samples. But when we when we consider our own histories and know that uh, we're all from immigrant families and that our families came to the United States es escaping the same kinds of issues that motivate uh, those from Southeast Asia or motivate those from Latin America today. So I think when we when we're able to see in ourselves that that experience, it also uh, helps us to understand a little bit more what might be motivating our more recent uh, right. immigrants and refugees. And I think, I think curiosity, loving curiosity is a really important uh, character, characteristic at, as we enter into conversations um, because it's hard to know what someone brings into a conversation if they're feeling uh, really threatened by, you know, having uh, greater numbers of refugees uh, enter the, our country. And so, um, yeah, just um, respectful and loving curiosity, I think, is important. Great. Thank you both. I think that actually is a really nice place to end our Q&A, as you've both demonstrated both uh, having the conversation by talking and listening to one another. Uh, which is so important um, as well. So with that, uh, once again, Bishop Spenningson and Archbishop Hebda, we really thank you for taking the time to be with us and reflect on this important topic tonight of welcoming the immigrants and refugees in their communities. To all of you who joined us, thank you too for your participation. We hope it's been a fruitful conversation for you to listen to and also have with one another. This evening's session was recorded and it will be made available uh, for viewing. And a follow-up email, email will be sent tomorrow that includes some additional resources that you can take a look at, as well as a request for feedback regarding this presentation. So take a look for that email tomorrow. At this time, uh, the bishops are going to offer us a closing prayer and blessing. And Bishop Spenningson? Yeah, one quick note I wanted to share with you that the baby was born in the part in the hospital in the parsonage and was named. This is the baby of the uh, Eritrean refugees. Her name is Rahwa, which means gift and hope for a better future. And I just think that's what we all want for all of God's people that they see themselves as gift and that they experience in life the hope for a better future. And uh, so Rahwa is that beautiful name. The prayer I will close with is actually from the uh, US um, CCB, the Catholic bishops. It's called the prayer for migrants and refugees. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, when you multiplied the loaves and fishes, you provided more than food for the body. You offered us the gift of yourself, the gift which satisfies every hunger and quenches every thirst. Your disciples were filled with fear and doubt, but you poured out your love and compassion on that migrant crowd, welcoming them as sisters, brothers, as siblings. O oh Lord Jesus, today you call us to welcome the members of God's family who come to our land to escape oppression, poverty, persecution, violence, or war. Like your disciples, we too are filled with fear and doubt and sometimes suspicion. We can build barriers in our hearts and in our minds. O oh Lord Jesus, help us by your grace to banish fear from our hearts, to welcome migrants and refugees with joy and generosity, to share of our abundance as you spread a banquet before us, to give witness to your love for all people as we celebrate the many gifts they bring. Oh God, we praise you and give you thanks for the family you have called together from so many people. 
we see in this big human family a reflection of the divine unity of the one most holy trinity in whom we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. And Bishpan, you drew on the USCCB. I'll draw a little bit on Pope Francis for this blessing. Good. Merciful God and creator of all, we seek your blessing this evening. May it be a blessing that wakes us from the slumber of indifference, open, opens our eyes to the sufferings of our refugee and immigrant sisters and brothers, and frees us from the insensitivity born of worldly comfort and self-centeredness. Inspire us as individuals, communities, and nations to see that those who come to our shores are our brothers and sisters. May we share with them the blessings we have received from your hand. Send down your blessing upon us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that we may be that church that you desire this night and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you once again, everyone. We hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate.